How is the Buzz TV family doing tonight? Welcome back to our show. I'm Brian Race, the co-host of Buzz TV. This show designed for beekeepers, for people just like you that want to learn and get better at the hobby of beekeeping. And tonight's show, man, it's loaded. Tons of educational material in an entertaining style. And speaking of education, I want to go ahead and let the cat out of the bag. We've got a big flash sale that's going to be 20% off all educational items there at mountainsweethoney.com. Keep listening for exactly the coupon code that you'll need to use. And speaking of Mountain Sweet Honey, they are the sponsor. We're so grateful to them uh, for bringing us Buzz TV. Their owner is Ray Sivitz. He is also the host of our show. Let's welcome in Ray. How are you, sir? Doing good, Brian. It's good to be back from southwest florida i wish i was back in southwest florida considering the weather what was the low 62 or something like I that? i just know those 80, 80 degrees, degrees uh, yeah. 80 degree days were wonderful well hey we got a lot to cover so let's get started with this show buzz tv is all about educating beekeepers from coast to coast tonight we're going to be looking at the upcoming bee shortage not only for this year, but next year. And we're going to take a deep dive into what's driving those shortages, not only here in the United States, but in Canada. Then we're going to move on to our hurricane relief in Fort Myers, Florida, where we visit Pine Island and meet Urea Underhill. And this is a picture of her being interviewed by Fox 4 there in Fort Myers. Right after we got done through interviewing her, Fox 4 came in and, and did a really good interview, and we hope to share that with you also. We also are going to be welcoming John Carone with Pirco. He's going to be talking about some of his products. And last but not least, the Ask Ray segment that, that you ask questions to me. And if you have questions, please send them to us uh, on, on YouTube. You can just put a comment out there. And if we don't answer it tonight, We'll definitely answer it on our next broadcast. So with that, let's talk about our flash sale. All right, folks, it's time for our flash sale for tonight's show. It's all about educational books. As we all know, this is a time of the year that we're sitting around in our living room trying to keep warm and nothing like pulling out a book on beekeeping to help deepen our knowledge on beekeeping. Tonight's first book of three that I want to talk about is Beekeeping Basics. Beekeeping Basics is put out by Penn State University, and this is a staple that we use in every one of our beekeeping classes, and it almost follows our beekeeping classes to the T. It starts you from not knowing anything about beekeeping into a medium state of understanding on beekeeping. So excellent book lots of color pictures within this textbook. Now, the next one is Mini Meadows. And this one was just by happen chance that we found this book, but there's a whole section in this book that is dedicated to um, helping you feed your bees through wildflowers and setting up that wildflower garden for your bees. Full of color, it's a hardcover book, excellent book completely on that there. Now, the final one is one that we get questions on every day, and that is, how do I find my queen? And it's all about training your eyes on how to find the queen. And this one here, this book is all about helping train your eyes how to find the queen. And it's a hardcover book and lots of color pictures. And it's kind of like, Finding Waldo, but it's finding the queen in this book here. Now, how do you get this, this discount? First of all, you can use the QR code on the bottom right-hand side and use coupon code BUZZTV when you check out, and that will give you a 20% off all of our education books. Like I said, this is just three books out of, I guess, a dozen or so books that we carry. They're all good but I just wanted to highlight three of these books uh, for you all this evening. January is a very important month for beekeepers and your bee colony. In December, beekeepers typically go out and feed their bees at the beginning of the month and then go back in at, at the end of December 
And that is to do an inspection to see how much sugar water has been consumed. And what they see is very little has been consumed and they make a decision, hey, if they only use this much in December, I can get by in January and February and maybe even March. But that is a wrong assumption. What you do want to do is do those inspections on a monthly basis on the sugar water to make sure that there's adequate sugar water for your, your colony. Now, the next thing that you want to look for is pollen, uh, pollen patties to feed your bees. Those pollen patties offer amino acids and, of course, pollen and sugars that your bees will need to thrive going into the spring months. So let's not forget those two components of feeding your bees. Now, how do you figure how much honey stores are left in your hive? Simply go back behind your hive, lift it up a half inch to an inch to see if it's heavy or if it's very light. If it is light, that means your honey stores are missing and you really need to make sure that your hive is being fed the sugar water that it needs during this time. So don't forget, do the, the lift. And if it's light, that means you got to really feed hard. If it's heavy, then that means it's okay. There's plenty of honey stores to get you through the winter months. Now let's take a look at the upcoming bee shortage that's going to be happening in 2023 and 2024. This is a big one, folks, and I don't know anyone that has covered this topic, and this is the reason why I wanted to talk about it on tonight's show. Let's take a look at Florida. Typically, this is a, a go-to place for uh, migratory beekeepers and backyard beekeepers uh, on that there. So during September through the winter months, migratory beekeepers are right in the middle of the heart of the state of Florida. Now, when we look at Florida, Florida is the fourth largest honey producing state uh, in the nation. And when we look at Florida in particularly, there's 5,000 beekeepers managing roughly 700,000 colonies. And that's coming from the Florida Department of Agriculture and the University of Florida. Now, when we look at what happened after Ian, uh, the initial number was 300,000 from the Florida Department of Agriculture, but that has been moved up just recently to 380,000 colonies lost. So when we're looking at that 380,000 hives that are lost, that does not include the migratory beekeepers that go into the state of Florida in August and September and over winter through to January, say. So that could easily be 100,000 hives that are lost there. So the total lost hives from Hurricane Ian is roughly 480,000. And that would be roughly 20% of, of a bee loss for the complete nation on that level. So huge losses. There is no way that the bee community can boost enough in any given season to replace those. So that's a huge issue. I don't know how that is gonna be overcome except by time. And time is, is an issue that we're also gonna to have to be looking at for pollination purposes. So let's take a look at, at California now. California is a whole different issue, but it involves flooding from the large precipitation that the, the state has had over the last three to four weeks. And our calculation right now, which is not very scientific, but we would forecast that there's roughly 100,000 hives that have been lost due to lowlands that have been flooded. You add that together with Florida, now you have 580,000 hives that have been flooded or windblown uh, that will not survive coming into the new season. Now, with that said, let's move on to Canada. Uh, Canada has also suffered roughly um, from coast to coast, and and that coast to coast loss is anywhere between sixty and seventy five percent of their hives uh, 
are gone. And this is thought to be Varroa and the diseases that they carry that has really hurt the Canadian beekeepers there. Now, we must be reminded that the, the country of Canada does not allow imports of honeybees from the United States. And the Canadian beekeepers are looking at changing some of those laws, but time is, is really ticking on this. And for them to have those bees, they're going to need those right into the early part of May coming into the country. And we all know how long legislation takes, especially when it's importation issues and uh, part of agriculture, a lot of fences need to be taken down before honeybees can be brought in. And this has really put the beekeepers in, in Canada uh, in a real quandary because there's no place to go except re, um, reinvesting in their operations and splitting and splitting and splitting. And as we all know, those splits take time to grow out and you're not going to get that your first year or second year in the quantities that these beekeepers, commercial beekeepers and backyard beekeepers need in Canada. So with, with that said, I, I just don't see um, our, our, our bread baskets, both in, in Canada and the U.S., receiving the proper pollination that they need for their crops. Now, let's take a look at the, the migratory beekeepers and try to bring this all into uh, play here. Now, they load up in, uh, typically in southern Texas. And let's go to the next slide there. They'll, they'll be loading up in southern Texas and also from Florida and either going to California. And a majority of those migratory guys are going to California for the almonds because of the, the price paid uh, per, per um, colony is anywhere from 200 to 220 dollars a month for the pollination of the almonds. So there's a lot of traffic that is normally going out there, but with with, with the reduced um, colonies, I don't see pollination of of the um, of the almond groves being sufficient for this year. And for those that don't know. Uh, the United States has 80% of the almond crops that were that we put both domestically and internationally exporting. And almonds need extra pollination for them to, to harvest the, the nuts that they're supposed to on that there. So I see personally uh, a reduced uh, part of the almonds. And just talking about the almonds, is because of water rationing in California, a lot of these um, growers have decided just to opt out than to pay uh, the extravagant price for water out there. And they're just pulling their trees out of the ground and, and uh, trying to reduce the water that is needed to keep their orchards going. So we have crops also uh, because once the migratory guys leave the fields of the almond trees. They're heading back south to Texas and to Florida to begin the pollination of melons and, and the fruit trees uh, there and working themselves northward. So I see a pollination problem for not only this year, but next year. And just as a reminder, you know, pollination uh, takes anywhere from 5% to 30% of what we eat on our table every day needs to have that pollination. So um, I see higher food prices coming in the, in the months uh, to come. And of course we're, we're all suffering from high grocery bills, uh, but I only see it going higher on that there. Uh, let's go to the next slide. And then on top of everything else, we had two to three weeks of bitter coldness uh, going from December into January. And I would predict that some of the Southern beekeepers have lost hives because they have screen bottom boards and it just did not keep the R factor right for the, the warmth retention within the hive. So it, it's a sad story 
is the bees have taken a hard hit uh, over the last three and a half months, uh, beginning in Florida and then to California, and then the coldness uh, here in December and January. So let, let's let's see what we can do to get out of this, but I don't see any quick answers for the bee loss that, that has happened. Folks, I wanted to share with you the experience that Brian and I had going to Florida and we've interviewed all three of these beekeepers that you all have given your hard earned money to help get back into the hobby of beekeeping. And what each of them thought was that we were going to give them just one hive. And we had a surprise. It wasn't going to be one, it was going to be four or five hives that each of them would, would be getting. So um, join us as we go back and, and, into last week and see what, what all happened out there on each of our visits. And again, this is Urea Underhill out on Pine Island with her farm out there. Urea, yeah. I am here in Southwest Florida, otherwise known as Pine Island. Welcome, we are so glad to have you here. Well, it is good to be here. I, I appreciate you just taking your time to tell us your story. You got a great story. and. All of our viewers would love to hear what your story is and what happened out here. And and then we're gonna go over and we're gonna get you your beehive at that point, okay? Awesome. All right, well, let, let's start out with how many years have you been in beekeeping? Um, really since 2020. I'm, I'm fairly mm -hmm. new. Uh, we moved down here to start the farm and um, I've really always researched bees, bees, but we were finally in a place to have them. So uh, we bought our first hive and, yes. and started in 2020. All right. And was that when you got here that you started? Yes. Okay. Um, we moved here August of 20. And whenever your first shipment came out, yes. that is when the middle of March. March. Yep. The middle of March. Okay. So I think. Whoop. I think you guys had actually had um, a little bit of a cold season and we were a little bit delayed. Two years ago, yes, yeah. you yeah. are exactly right. <laughs> and two years ago, it was a two week delay. It was, um, and I was hanging on and hoping they were good up there because you guys had quite the yes. cold snap. Well, we appreciate your business there. Um, now you took that one hive and then you made several more. Yes, um, the, the first hive, uh, I had for about a year because that was the recommendation to kind of to wait it out. Um, I did. Uh, I made a split and, um, it, you know, it was funny. Sometime in between there, it was like people were calling and come check out this and hey, come over here and look yes. at this. And hey, I have a water meter that has bees yes. in it. And it just like they found me. And since then, uh, I got the bee and mm -hmm. ordered more and mm -hmm. it's been and how much how many hives did you end up with we were at about 22 22 hives yes and that was mostly to pollinate here at the farm am i correct it was yes and what kind of crops are you starting to grow out here? um well the 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 main crop is uh designer mangoes um mm -hmm. bees don't typically pollinate those. However, we are sitting mm -hmm. inside the food forest, which has a collection of other tropical um, tropical fruits, as well as neighboring farms in the yes. area as well. Well, very good. Um, and you lost all 22. Yes. And was there anything left when you got out here? Because I know the bridge was out. Right. And, and what was your, how were you feeling during that time of going over the bridge? Uh, well, my first trip to the island was not over the bridge. It was actually the kayak trip here. Ah. 18, about 18 miles round trip. It was three days after the hurricane, the bridge was gone and we had to get out here to see what, what it was like. Um, we kayaked out here and it, as you can imagine, it was devastation. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I think the waters must have just receded because you could literally see where it was stacked up on certain areas. Mm -hmm. and. Um, you know, some of the beehives were mangled and, and thrown places, mm -hmm. some that we did find, but it was just, it was just the green. remnants uh, yeah. at that point. Um, one of the hives up here actually, uh, 
when I fight, we came in from the back of the property yes. and, and came up to the front and it was tipped over and I didn't bring any, I mean, I had my hood, my veil and I was trying to set them up. But I didn't have smoke or anything and they mm. were just going crazy. So yes. there was no, I, I mean, I remember I'm, I'm trying to help you. I was saying, I'm yeah, yeah. sorry, I'm sorry, mm. but they, I don't think they either moved on or didn't make yeah. it, but that was the only one I saw. That would probably be when the water recessed um, because yeah. they would have left er uh, earlier if it, if it had. So I, I agree with that statement there. Right. Um, now, tell us a little bit about September the 28th. How much of a notice did you have that, you know, you guys were going to be right in the middle of the hurricane? Um, you know, as Floridians, uh, what can I say? Uh, what? We're prepared down here for the most part for mm -hmm. hurricanes. We live here. We have to assume some risk. Um, we we saw it coming. We had an escape route. He was getting everything prepared out here as much as we mm -hmm. could. Um, but then it kind of changed direction and looked like a direct hit. And at that point, we were like, if we leave now, we're going to be driving right through it. Um, mm -hmm. So let's hunker down and, and hope for the best. I, you know... I, it wasn't, we knew the hurricane was coming. We all kind of prepare, but you never really know where mm -hmm. it's going to go. Um, I wish I would have been more prepared. Looking back with the hives, you know, there's that tug of war, taking care of yourself and Absolutely. also taking care of your bees. Mm -hmm. What would you do differently given the same thing happens again? Um, being versed in emergency response and, and those type of protocols, I definitely have laid out uh, processes for myself yes. uh, in the future. Um, I've thought about different types of structures to which the mounds could be adhered to. I've thought about evacuation routes in order to get them out if it looked um, like a, a threatening situation. Um, I'm definitely coming up with an emergency response plan for future hives. Well, that's, that's a good thing. Sometimes there's just nothing that we can do as beekeepers because uh, as the tidal water came up here, right. you can't get it up high enough. Right. And, and you can't move 20 hives in 30 minutes. Nope. And it might take all day to move those 30 hives. And I think that was kind of um, a point we got to was like preparing beforehand if we knew it was coming, the trajectory of it, um, maybe we do move them to more inland mm -hmm. um, a week prior mm -hmm. or, or something. But that you only had a couple of days, wasn't it? Uh, I mean, we knew it was going to come. They projected it was going to hit Tampa first, I think, initially. Yes. So we, we knew we were going to get some outer bands, but we didn't know it was going to mm -hmm. be direct. However, you've got to assume the worst, right? Like, yes. it's coming that close. It's a hurricane. And that sucker was bigger than the whole state of Florida. So yes. we all knew at that point we were we were in for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, your preparedness, you got you got the notice. It's coming in. Mm -hmm. and it's coming in fast. Mm -hmm. And what what happened with you and your husband? What what were some of the decisions that you had to make at that point? Because you had the farm out here. You you live inland. Right. Uh, of course, our main focus was this. This is, has been our dream, our goal for 10 plus years. Um, obviously, he is worried about the trees and he's coming out here and staking them up as much as possible. Mm. Um, afterwards, it was really the, the sodium content of the water and, yep. and them being affected by that. So him coming out here and just making sure and uh, rinsing them down and making sure they're propped up and the dirt is, mm -hmm. is appropriate. I mean, there's just so many different things that we did beforehand. Um, but sometimes it's not enough. Now, I'm glad you brought up the sodium content. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. what, 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 are, what are some of the challenges that you're facing here on your farm with this tidal wave that came through and it set here for a while? Uh, you know, I wish I would have been here to see exactly what would have happened, of course. Um, was it the water that affected them? Was it the wind? Uh, we mm -hmm. we obviously had the hive strapped down, but 
what is yeah. that going to do? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, then, you know, I only had them on cinder blocks raised up a little bit. So if they had been a little bit higher, there was a pretty safe uh, wind buffer medium at the bottom where it didn't mm -hmm. seem like things that under three feet didn't get hit as hard by the wind, but then the water. Yeah. Um, yeah. So thankfully, the this um, parcel is a little bit higher. Um, north of the island is a little bit higher. So I think just working off your, your setting and, and trying to... Uh, so, Urea, yes. um, with the salt water that has come in, and, and, and what was it for about a 24-hour period uh, or 48 hours? I, I think the salt was our major concern afterwards because the, the flood waters had gotten so high. Mm -hmm. um, the south of the island, I mean, their, their garages were under. Yes. Um, so the settling of it, you could literally see the, the, the sodium residue on stuff once the water was gone. Um, and then it was so dry and we didn't have any rain. I, I would venture to say it might have been a couple weeks that we were kind of yeah. in a holding period, just worried that yeah. the sodium was too much for, for a lot of it. Now with the, with the sodium, the only, the only part that you really had a negative part on is getting it on the leaves of your various crops. Would well, the be... roots, we were worried and about roots. the roots and too. Roots. Okay. Because of the water level and how long it, it sat, we were worried about root rot as well. Yes. So I, I, it, the sodium, I, it was a trifecta, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. All right, so Urea. I told you that I was going to bring one hive, but today we're bringing five. Come on over. What's <laughs> up, so much. We couldn't do this if it wasn't for our customers. We asked them, jump behind us. There was people that gave $25. There's people that gave 50, 100, and even 200. And they care about you. And we care about you. Thank you guys so much. It's so incredible. Well, we're happy for you. This gets you back on your feet. Thank you. And the bees will be here in March to fill these up. Yeah. All right? Yeah. Thank all right. you so much. Thank you all so much. Well, very good. You're right. What are you feeling, babe? Oh my gosh, it's just so incredible. I don't. It's it's a mission. The bees are a mission um, to to the world. Uh, it's such a bigger calling mm -hmm. than than just what is here. Um, for all the farmers, for the ecosystem on Pine Island, um, the bees are a big part of that, and I'm glad to help out in any way I can and and be of service. This is it, your 10 year dream, you said. Oh, I, yes, I, it's, it's incredible to, to have this and to see it become what it has. Um, it's definitely like a baby in our dream to us and we hope that it gives back to everyone as much as it has for us. Folks, if that wasn't enough, Fox 4 News out of Fort Myers and their, their evening news anchor, Nadine Yaris, was there recording a lot of what we were doing for our interview and then also doing side shoots. So what happened was, is we thought that it was just going to be on the five and six o'clock news hour, but it also was added the 10 o'clock news hour. I, I should say Nadine was beyond excited to be covering this story as they're trying to show people that are in the Fort Myers area are recovering and this is a big news item for them that in their news station uh, of promoting the rebound there in Fort Myers. Brian, let's run that clip. Well, backyard beekeepers across Southwest Florida are getting a surprise. This all thanks to a company in Georgia concerned about the bee pipe population wiped out in our state. Entomologists at the University of Florida estimate that Hurricane Ian destroyed 380,000 bee colonies in our state. That equals to about a 15% loss of the nation's bee population. Many of those bees right here in Southwest Florida. That's why CEO Ray Civitz with Georgia's Mountain Sweet Honey 
Company is here for the next two days surprising backyard beekeepers with new hives to bring their bees back. Fox 4 cameras there as he surprised Urea Underwood at Get Amazing Farm on Pine Island today. In tears as the five hives delivered will now bring her back to 100% within two years. It's just so incredible. I don't, it's, it's a mission. The bees are a mission um, to to the world. Uh, it's such a bigger calling than, than just what is here. Um, for all the farmers, for the ecosystem on Pine Island, um, the bees are a big part of that. And I'm glad to help out in any way I can and, and be of service. And the surprises didn't end there. Ray and his company actually are helping three Southwest Florida beekeepers. This is video with Ray delivering five hives to a Sanibel beekeeper this morning who also lost all of his bees. And then tomorrow they'll head over to donate another five hives to a beekeeper in Northport. Brian, this was a life changing trip going down to Southwest Florida for the three mm. days that we were there. We left what uh, 5 a.m. bright and early Monday morning. Yep. And my life changed in Warner Robins. My first time at Bucky's. I mean that that was that was <laughs> something just to see what what do we we counted like 25 ice machines and 80 I, I gas pumps or more on, a, on the National Lampoon uh, <laughs> uh, Christmas vacation one there with you coming out. You were there. In it the was moment. it was something. So we're heading down 75, of course, to take a. Uh, a load of, of beehives and equipment to, to those that were impacted by Hurricane yeah, Ian. We had a full bed on, on the back of my 3500 Chevy Silverado filled to the gills. We had our camera equipment in the back seat and uh, what little luggage we brought, it filled everything up. We were filled to the gills going down. And then as we got closer to the devastated area, we started to notice uh, signs that had been twisted up, these yep. metal signs. And then all of a sudden... Uh, well, those those metal signs, Brian, those are DOT major signs that say, get off this exit to, say, Fort, Fort Myers. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and they were just twisted, or a twist and a half. And these are major steel beams that were just turned around. That was our first sign that uh, something had happened as we got closer. We started seeing all these blue roofs in the distance. And I yeah. think I think we've got a picture here. Let me pull that up. Describe what uh, we're looking at. Well, these roofs have been compromised. And, and they were leaking uh, some water, a lot of water. And part of the relief operation is getting these tarps out to these homeowners so that they can have a dry space to live. And this on. is all over the area. This isn't yeah. just the neighborhood you're seeing in the photograph. This was neighborhood after neighborhood. And then when we got onto the, the islands uh, there on the, the Gulf coast, everybody seemed to have one of these blue roofs. Yes. And you know, it, it, it's amazing. Uh, you know, we have some amazing stories from, from uh, Brad McKenzie that we're going to talk about out on mm -hmm. Sanibel Island. We're going to, we're going to be talking to Sean Gubati uh, up at Northport, Florida. But you know, Brian, when we rolled in um, to the hotel that night, we saw a command center being, uh, being well used the whole lobby. And it was these red t-shirted guys. And on the back, it said army Corps of engineers. And, you know, I didn't want to interrupt them because, man, they were, it mm -hmm. was a command center mm -hmm. and they were yelling back and forth and talking to each other on something. But I didn't find out until the next morning as we were checking out and the elevator stopped at the next floor going down. And one of these red shirted, t shirted guys jumped in and, and I said, Well, what are you guys doing? And he said, Working. And I said, Well, what are you working on? And, uh, and he told me these, these big, dump trucks and dump trucks isn't a proper word it's it's it i've got i've got truck. one of those here these are huge vehicles with grapplers on them and they fill these up quickly and take them either to the dump or into a mulch center and there were hundreds of them down there they he said 600 mm -hmm. uh of these these setups were running around fort myers collecting refuse either building material or 
uh, some kind of agricultural products such as palm palm trees or or even trees themselves. So they were keeping up with all of that. And they'd already been there for three months. And he said at least another six months on cleanup. So when we don't see it in the news, it's still real mm-hmm. life there, there in Florida. And, you know, it, 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 it's kind of numbing because of the news cycle. It might catch it for a couple of days, but then they move on to another story. Mm-hmm. But the story is still being lived out in Fort Myers. Although, I guess it was a couple of nights ago, I was listening uh, to the news on the radio and they had found some bodies that had been missing since the hurricane. Mm. I know Mm. you had pointed out to me a dredging operation. They had found an individual that uh, decided to ride out the hurricane in his boat. 72-year-old gentleman just said, I'm going to ride this out in in, in the boat. And it took three and a half months to to recover his body. Well, Another thing that, that blew my mind is they had a boat show there, but the boats weren't in the water. <laughs> they were on land. And the reason why they're on land is there's too much debris in the bay. If they run one of these new boats, we saw, it. we saw one of those houses that was, yeah. was, was out there yep. uh, still that had not been removed. So yep. yeah, that makes sense. And, and then just to hear about how it personally affected the three individuals that we were able again to to bless through the generosity yep. of the Buzz TV and Mountain Sweet Honey yes. a family and to to really help change their lives. That, that of course, the, yep. the reason we went. And they were deeply moved, folks. Mm-hmm. I mean, that that you as, as our customers and viewers of this program cared enough about them to, to give $25 all the way up to $500. Uh, it, it just numbed them. And they were just really shell-shocked of the goodness of the beekeepers uh, that that are in our listening area from coast to coast. Salt of the earth, folks. That's why the, the bee community is such a special group of people. And uh, uh, again, with without your help, uh, we couldn't have, have done what we did. It was well worth the, the, the one day driving down and the one day driving back, putting in 1,400 miles in three days. And and getting these interviews put together, and uh, I, is this a, something you could see us doing again if we were made aware of of particular needs? Uh, we are going to we're we're folks we're going to do this as crisis hits our country and especially our beekeepers. We're going to come on live. We're going to tell you what the need is. Uh, Mount Sweet Honey doesn't make a penny on any of this. We 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 do it at cost. And we handle all of the, the handling fees, all of the, the loading fees, the, the toll fees, the gas fees, the hotel fees of getting it down there and getting it, getting back home afterwards. Um, but this is something that we want to give back, um, whether you live in Texas or anywhere on the Gulf Coast or up and down the Atlantic uh, seaboard. We want to be there for you, for you as beekeepers, or even if it's a tornado that comes through, Brian, you know, just let us know. Yeah. I mean, obviously something like a hurricane, everybody knows yep. about it. Yep. Uh, there may be a situation you are aware of that impacted mm-hmm. a fellow beekeeper. Yep. Uh, don't hesitate to, to reach out buzz TV, uh, at mountain sweet honey.com buzz TV at mountain sweet honey.com. We, we can't uh, help if we don't know about it. Mm-hmm. Well, Brian, we're two better men for this trip. Well, next time, bring a cameraman that remembers to hit record every time. <laughs> gotcha. All right, folks, let, let's see what we got here next. We got John Carone with Pirco, and let's go to him now. Before we get to our interview with John Carone, John has been on our show previously, and you, our viewers, have asked for more information on Pirco products. I would like to welcome John Carone, CEO of Pierco in Riverside, California. John, welcome back to Buzz TV. Hi, Ray. Sure good to be back. Thanks for having me again. John, last time you were with us, you discussed your plastic foundation. Today, let's backtrack a little and tell us about your company for those who did not see our previous show. Absolutely, Ray. Uh, thanks for asking. You know, who, who is Pierco? Oh, Pirco is a, we're, we're a manufacturer, which is extremely important, uh, meaning we make our own product, uh, the, the frames and foundations and drone cone in-house. 
along with we distribute a variety of other uh, beekeeping products which are uh, requested from the beekeeper. Uh, in the areas of, of uh, wood boxes and frames and, and feeders and, and protective wear and things of that nature. Uh, we're located out in Riverside, California. Um, we have a large facility, which is, uh, once again, uh, our molding operation, which runs 24 hours a day, for, which is pretty exciting. And, and we do waxing operations here. We do warehouse and distribution, quality control. And, and then we have a retail store that uh, some of the regional folks get to come by and be clubs and, uh, and pick up their products and buy products. And, and then we have our team of people. Uh, w- without them, we could do nothing. So, um, We've been around for a little while, uh, 45 plus years, and uh, um, we've got a great operation. It's family owned, but we pretty much sell to every state in the country, all provinces of Canada, and uh, uh, a variety of countries throughout the world. So uh, uh, welcome to Pirco. Thank you, sir. John, tell us about what you do. What do we do? Well, I, I give you a little overview of, uh, of, of who we are, which is kind of what we do as well. Um, what we do specifically, Ray, is uh, we are a plastic manufacturer with uh, injection molding capabilities, which is the, uh, uh, the the best way to make a plastic foundation and or a frame. It's the most precision way you can make it. It's high speed. It brings quality. It brings efficiencies. And and we're able to bring a, a uh, those attributes to the customer. Um, and then uh, what we also do is we get involved in all facets of the bee industry from education, uh, uh, outreach like we're doing today. Um, we deal with bee clubs and we deal with um, uh, organizations throughout the bee industry and and uh, we, we help people. Uh, that, that's what P- Pirco is. That's what we do. And, and we're just grateful to be in this industry. John, please tell our viewers about your one-piece Pirco frame. Oh, the one-piece plastic frame. It's where Pirco started. Uh, there, there was a gentleman. His name was uh, Paul Pierce, i.e. Pirco. And, and this guy was, uh, I, I never got to meet Paul. He, he, had, uh, he had been gone before I got involved in beekeeping. Uh, and uh, um, back in the 50s and 60s, this, this gentleman was a renowned beekeeper. And uh, he had an idea where um, wood frames were uh, causing some challenges in the industry. And, and he wanted to create something that was easier, simple, um, durable, strong. Um, all the above, and he, uh, along with a plastic uh, uh, manufacturer way back then, um, came up with this part design, uh, which he patented. Um, we, uh, we, we, many years later, we're still using uh, the, the one-piece plastic frame. Um, it is a precision cell. Uh, we wax them. It's uh, all one piece, so it can't come apart. It's durable as heck. Um, and uh, uh, through the years, we've made some advancements. We, we've, uh, um, we've made stronger ears. We've made the parts flatter. We've made them more durable. So we've learned through the decades, um, but it's one of the most durable, easy to use products that you put in your bee box that the bees will um, uh, work the, uh, the frame and uh, basically build comb and uh, produce honey and, and produce more bees. John, does Pirco offer double and triple wax coatings on on this frame? Uh, absolutely, Ray. It's it's interesting because we actually have for for quite a while, and it wasn't very well advertised or market because the demand wasn't there. Um, single wax had been kind of the company standard for many years, um, and in the last five or six years, primarily, uh, maybe a little longer, uh, people started saying you know, hey, I, I require more wax. I, I have to do it myself. Is that something you can provide? And we're like, well, yeah, all you have to do is ask and maybe we need to ask as well. But uh, the double wax is exactly that. We are known for putting a good amount of single wax. And when we say double, we actually have a metering process and a weight process to warrant putting the double the amount of wax. Um, same thing go- going on for triple. Um, by doing so, the bee is that much more comfortable to work in the foundation. Um, the exact specifications of that cell, uh, the depth, the wall dimensions, um, the precision of that, along with a good coating of wax and good wax being capping wax, domestic wax, um, the bees love it, they work it, and we get a lot of feedback from our customers that we're doing something right. 
Well, from my personal experience, I've seen my bees draw out double and triple wax frames far quicker than single wax applications. And, you know, I've also seen foreign shipped in products that don't have even a slight coat of wax. And of course the bees reject that. And, and I, I am very happy to say I've never experienced that with Pirco products. No, we, uh, we, we've learned through the years that uh, quality is, is extremely important. And, and that's why we like to, that's why I'm grateful we're a manufacturer. Um, we don't do anything else uh, other than beekeeping, other than Pirco. Um, we're, we're not a we're not a custom molder. We don't farm other things in like some others out there. Our, all our focus is on our manufacturing facility, uh, our quality in the area of how we make a part, um, and how we apply the right wax. And what we have found through the years is, if you again, if you put the right wax, which is, you know, we we use a domestic clean capping wax and a good amount of it and it, it's not cheap it, it costs money to do those kind of things quality is is uh we're not the cheapest guy in town but we're, we're the highest quality in town and uh people uh it's important for the bees it's important for the customer it's important for the industry and i really love picking up one of those frames and smelling the real fresh scent of newly melded uh hot wax on, on it it just smells so great. And that's a quality control thing that we do uh, every time we, we get a load in from anybody is, hey, does it smell like wax? It's so critical. You know, um, we, we don't put any additives in there. Um, we don't buy paraffin wax. We don't be, bring things for, in from overseas. Um, what we do is we... we uh, through the years, we've developed very good relationships with a few selected wax suppliers, and we know who they are. They know who we are. We go back to them routinely, and we have a good quality control system uh, and supplier base of who we get our wax from, how we get our wax, and then, then we put the proper amount in, and uh, um, we like it as much as the bees. Can you share with us, John, where you are headed as a company? Yeah, we've got a we've got a lot of work, as you know, Ray. We're we're constantly trying to bring um, further education, further products, for, further innovation uh, to to the industry, and, and we're grateful to be part of that. Um, we we uh, we brought in uh, some additional feeders. We brought in some additional supplements and feeds um, and things of that nature, which we can talk about further. And then, in addition, we're coming into um, the show circuit, the, the trade show circuit. And there's a lot of education there. Um, we get to be part of uh, California State Beekeepers Association, which is going to be up in Reno in November. Uh, it's one of the biggest shows for us uh, on this side of the country. Um, we're involved with national programs like uh, AHPA, uh, American Honey Producers Association. And we'll be out in Tucson in, uh, uh, in the coming months. And uh, American Beekeeping Federation, which is probably the largest in the country, uh, going to be out in Jacksonville, Florida in January and, and a variety of others. And we get to go out. We get to go rub, rub elbows with uh, other suppliers. We get to see our customers and shake their hand, not just meet them over the screen or over the phone. And, and I enjoy that. And we get to get some educational nuggets um, of what, what do people need? What do they want? What are their problems? And, and then we get to come up with solutions. I want to thank John Carone for being on our show today. Folks, don't forget, Quality Foundation begins with Pirco, the name you can trust. John, thank you for joining us and talking about your company and your foundation. Ray, thanks for having me. And I, I, I'm grateful to be part of uh, uh, this show and Buzz TV and, and uh, working closely with you and your team. Folks, one of the things that I have found with talking with our beekeepers in Florida and also hearing about the devastation beekeepers are having out in California is where flooding is the major culprit of colony loss within Florida and also California. So I wanted to just take a moment and Brian, let's go ahead and put the slide up on, on there. Now, a lot of times when we look at flood zones. Maybe we don't even look for flood zones. Um, if you are in a flood zone, you got to be able to move your hives fairly quickly. 
And moving highs, as we all know, can be very, very time consuming, if not difficult on top of that. So what I would highly encourage us to look at is the 100 year flood zone and try to keep our hives out of that flood zone. So when, when a lot of precipitation comes in your neck of the woods, you're going to be above that flood plain and thus save your hives. I think that's one of the biggest takeaways with interviewing beekeepers is they were not aware that under significant circumstances that they would be in a floodplain. So that's, that's our takeaway. Um, if you're on the East coast and you get hurricanes coming in, you really want to find that higher ground or elevate your hives high, high enough so that they're not going to be in that flood zone. So that's our education, uh, coming out of this trip down to Florida and talking with beekeepers elsewhere. Now let's talk about our 2023 bee season update. A lot of things happen between now and 55 days from now when we start shipping bees. One of the things that we're going to be looking for is Mother Nature working with us this year as she did last year. February the 15th is a very, very important day because that's when we start setting out our queen boxes for mating flights. And these yards can be anywhere from 500 to 1,000 queens in a mating yard. And if there's temperatures that go under 45 degrees, there's a very, very good chance that these queens will die along with their small colony that, that's keeping the queen fed during this time. Also, is if we have rain days that come in, like four or five rain days, that's not going to allow the queen to be adequately mated. So there could be a one-week or up to a two-week delay in shipping. So we're keeping our fingers crossed, hoping that everything uh, goes well because, let, Brian, let's let's go back to that one slide because that's what we want to see is cage after cage after cage going out uh, in, in the mail system uh, to each of you that have ordered bees. Um, I think our first ship date, we have well over 1,500 packages going out, uh, mostly to folks in Texas and Florida. So, and the Gulf states. So it's going to keep us busy this season. And we're just keeping our fingers crossed that Mother Nature helps us out during this time. But this is your bee season update for 2023. Man, the show is flying by tonight, and uh, we've arrived at what I've said on many occasions. Uh, Ray is my favorite segment, the Ask Ray segment. Uh, people have been uh, leaving comments uh, there on Facebook, uh, on YouTube. By the way, remember to subscribe and hit that little notification bell so that future episodes, when they're made available, you'll be notified. And um, I just enjoy this segment. This is as a, a new beekeeper, a chance for me to learn and a chance to answer everybody's questions. Our first one out of uh, Bangor, Maine, John says, when should I have my bee package shipped to me? Well, John, what I would say is, is every climactic zone ha has a different shipping time to it. You might have a lot warmer temperature before you get 100 miles inland there in Maine. But the thing that you have to remember is, is this, this package will be going through <laughs> very deep freezing weather as it goes through Knoxville and, and up through the Appalachian mountains. So um, just because you have, have good weather the first, uh, the first week of April doesn't mean that those bees will stay in very nice warm weather on the way there. So what I would, I would recommend is that you get a date such as the first week of May, last week of April, and you would do very, very well with those two dates. Very cool. Thank you, John, for checking in. Our uh, next question from Rich. He's yes. in Jacksonville, Florida. And uh, what is the best bee? So I guess he's talking about the type of bee. What yes. is the best type of bee to purchase as a new beekeeper? Well, hands down, Italian honeybees are, are the best starter bee, as well as somebody that has been in it for 30 years. Uh, the Italian bees are the most docile bees that are out there. 
and easy to, to manipulate the hive, inspect the hive, and Italian bees by far are the best one to start with. And what's on the opposite end of the spectrum? What are the, well, the, the more, bee that you really would take? The more would aggressive say? would be your Russian hybrids or your um, carniolas. All right, so stick with the Italians. Yes. You, can't, you can't go wrong. There you go, Rich. Now, Anna is in Selma. Uh, okay. They Selma, have, Alabama. Uh, Selma, Alabama. Okay. Of course, they had uh, some bad tornadoes recently. Mm. So that's sort of an example of, you know, if you know people that were impacted as yep. beekeepers, you know, reach out to us. But uh, her question today, and again, this is Anna, what is the best age for a child to learn beekeeping? Anna, what I would say is the best age is when a child understands the command of the parent. If the parent says stop, the child must be able to stop at that point. Um, as we all know, dealing with bees, you will get stung. And it's just important that, that children understand, first of all, they have the motor skills with their fingers and that they can take instruction. And that can be as early as a, a five or six year old or as late as a 10 year old. Uh, getting started in, into beekeeping and there's every state association has a, a, a child's uh, beekeeping club. So um, there, there's plenty of those clubs on the state level. So the, the temperament of the child, the obedience yes. level of yeah. the child, the maturity yeah. level, all of those things yep. uh, should be factored in. I hope you will uh, be able to do that, Anna. And the final question, let me see where this one is from, uh, Saratoga, New York. I think there's a racetrack up in that uh, neck of the woods. Yeah, that's yeah. where the horses run, if I remember right. Well, Rusty, when he's not uh, down at the track, <laughs> uh, wants to know, uh, what color should I paint my hive? Oh, that, that's a good question. Um, first of all, when we paint a hive, it's with two to three coats of latex exterior, 10-year minimum uh, warranty on the paint. You want to do two to three coats on that. Now, you do not want to ever use dark colors mm. because that sucks in the heat during the hot summer days. So if your favorite football team has black as a part of their yeah. color, you don't want to put that. Or a, or a dark red. You okay. Know, any of the dark colors, uh, like a navy blue for Michigan, um, you wouldn't want to use that either. Mm. Um, you want to use pastel colors or white uh, that they are perfect colors for the, for the hot summers. And you will, uh, if you do use the, the, the dark colors, it will create an oven effect and the bees will exit out of the hive and very little will be done inside the hive during the, those late spring months and early summer months, which are key times for the bees to be bringing in nectar sources. I look forward to a future show where maybe we can just devote the whole hour to ask Ray. I think that would be fun maybe well, as, we, a, we might as, a, as a future show. But if we did not uh, get to your question uh, tonight, uh, we are going to be scouring through all the comments uh, sections, looking for great questions, and it might just be one that uh, is answered on a future edition of Buzz TV. Buzz TV at Mountain Sweet Honey, feel free to, dot com. Feel free to uh, drop us a line anytime with your questions and uh well, somebody on our staff will do their best to, to get back to you in a very timely manner. Very good. All right, folks, it's time for our flash sale for tonight's show. It's all about educational books. As we all know, this is a time of the year that we're sitting around in our living room trying to keep warm and nothing like pulling out a book on beekeeping to help deepen our knowledge on beekeeping. Tonight's first book of three that I want to talk about is Beekeeping Basics. Beekeeping Basics is put out by Penn State University, and this is a staple that we use in every one of our beekeeping classes, and it almost follows our beekeeping classes to the T. It starts you from not knowing anything about beekeeping into a medium state of understanding on beekeeping. So excellent book, lots of color pictures within this textbook. Now, the next one is Mini Meadows. And this one was just by happen chance that we found this book, but there's a whole section in this book that is dedicated to um, helping you feed your bees through wildflowers and setting up that wildflower garden for your bees. 
full of color. It's a hardcover book. Excellent book completely on that there. Now, the final one is one that we get questions on every day, and that is, how do I find my queen? And it's all about training your eyes on how to find the queen. And this one here, this book is all about helping train your eyes how to find the queen. And it's a hardcover book and lots of color pictures. And it's kind of like finding Waldo, but it's finding the queen in this book here. Now, how do you get this, this discount? First of all, you can use the QR code on the bottom right-hand side and use coupon code BUZZTV when you check out, and that will give you a 20% off all of our education books. Like I said, this is just three books out of, I guess, a dozen or so books that we carry. They're all good, but I just wanted to highlight three of these books uh, for you all this evening. Man, what a great flash sale that is. Hope you take advantage of that opportunity just to increase your knowledge. 20% off on all the uh, books there at mountainsweethoney.com. Uh, this has been a great show tonight. I've learned uh, quite a bit. Well, this has been our longest show, and we'll try to keep it. No, 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 no. Our longest show, I think, was some of those uh, Black oh, yeah, Friday yeah, and Cyber yeah, Monday yeah, uh, shows yeah. that went about three hours, yeah. which were great. I mean, yeah. we, we loved it, but yeah, yeah. this wasn't quite a three-hour show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, our, our next show is February the 23rd, which is a little over a month from now, and we'll be back on. We're going to give BC's an update for 2023. Mm -hmm. Uh, we'll have a lot of answers to right all the questions that you've raised about scarcity. We'll have a better grasp on that. Yeah, and we're seeing elevated orders as we speak on bees. So, if if you got an inkling to mm -hmm. want to buy bees, yeah, now's the time to do it because either they'll be gone or the prices will be very sky high mm -hmm. uh, across the board with everybody on that there. Mm -hmm. um, now, we also have Bobby Chasen coming back. Uh, this will be his second appearance yes, on Buzz his TV. second appearance. And we got some rave reviews on Bobby when he was here last. If you don't remember the name, he is the guy who was the expert in bee removal. So That's he had right. a lot to talk about when, you know, somebody, and I know you as beekeepers, you get those calls. There's bees that are hanging out in, you know, the, my backyard. What do I do? And Bobby was the uh, expert when it comes yes. to safely uh, removing them and I guess, giving them a new home. Yep. Rehoming them. Mm -hmm. Now we also have our other two beekeepers that we, that we saw when we were in Florida, we have uh, Brad and Sean, they're going to, they're going to be on the show uh, in February and folks, there mm -hmm. are powerful stories that these men went through uh, during this hurricane and you won't want to miss that there. Uh, we also Want, want folks to know where they can tune in, Brian. Can you tell, tell them where to tune in to see us? You can always uh, watch us wherever you're actually watching us, but you might be interested to know that uh, we are on YouTube at the Mountain Sweet Honey YouTube channel. We're also on Facebook. Again, uh, the, the channel, the, the page for Mountain Sweet Honey. And when you go to mountainsweethoney.com, uh, uh, there's a big Buzz TV button mm -hmm. that you can click. Uh, to view past episodes or to catch the live stream. Yes. And would you do us a favor and just share with one or two people uh, this yes. program? Let them know about uh, Buzz TV. Somebody you know would really be interested in spending an hour, hour and a half uh, with a couple of friends uh, learning mm -hmm. about uh, this great hobby. Well, Brian, I think that does it for, for tonight's broadcast. Can't wait till the next one. All right, folks. We'll see you then. Bye.